All right, welcome everyone. This is a good evening, good afternoon, and good morning for some of you. We'll begin in about three minutes. Um, and hopefully we will get a nice group and nice group that we can start sharing this morning's group was amazing and the ideas that were, you know, being thrown around and just all the challenges and success stories that were being discussed in the chat. So welcome everyone. Um, you have about two more minutes. So grab yourself some coffee if you're it's quite late or early morning where you are. You may need it just to stay awake throughout this presentation, but hopefully Dr. Dave and I will have enough energy to keep you guys interested in what we're saying. So it's, I wonder if Thailand is the furthest out or the earliest uh, of our folks here today. Yeah, it's seven uh, in the morning. Seven in the morning, wow. Yep. Thank you, Siobhan, for putting that in there. Let's see, we have Kristen from Tucson, so another Arizona person here today. Casa Grande, Arizona from Kathy, Salt Lake City, uh, Jennifer. What a lovely time to be in Salt Lake City. And if you haven't seen what I am, I'm holding, let me forward the slide a little bit. We've got one guess to what I'm holding. Any other guesses? Put it in the chat box. Nice, Madagascar, Roach. It is definitely a cockroach. And my colleagues and I raised them in our office, fed them lots and lots of citrus until they were powerful enough to be a collective to try to push the lid up of, over the aquarium, the terrarium that we had. And then we had to put an end to it and gave it to the insect zoo. All right, so it's 8.05 here in the Washington DC area. My name is Liza and I have with me Dr. Dave. Totally informal session that we have. The only thing formal about it are just some of the more bureaucratic things that we are asking of you. So if you are here to receive a certificate, you must attend the two sessions um, which the next one is next week. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do so It is on October 27th. We have a 10 a.m. Eastern time session as well as the same time right now. And another thing we'll be um, talking about homework assignments in between these two sessions, as well as a post-workshop project, which uh, trust me, it is not a dissertation. It is not a heavy lift. We just want to encourage everybody to do the work and also share the work and have people around the world take a look at some of your ideas and your thoughts and even responses to the homework. So I am going to start and I am going to go ahead and escape out of this. Bear with me for a second and put on my other slide. And just a reminder, next week's uh, session is on Thursday, not Wednesday. So um, just make a note of that in your calendars. Perfect. Nice group today. So if you do want to keep your um, video on, please do so. It's a nice, intimate group tonight. So 
I want to start the whole thing off with this. My son, when he he's 14 now in high school, but this is him in third grade. And I put together an expo on soil science and there were different stations. And this is the third expo that I put together um, when in his school since he started class there in kindergarten. And my younger son, when he hit kindergarten, I said to myself, I'm going to challenge myself to teach these kids I treat. Did I do it? Probably not. I didn't. Technology was wasted on five-year-olds unless it's about TikTok or Instagram. And then they're real good at doing, you know, finding certain things on TikTok and learning things. But back then when he, he's a fifth grader now, when he was in kindergarten, we taught them the principles of iTree. And really what that is, is in a nutshell, trees are, have superpowers. And what does that mean to little kids? And from then on, I've been on a journey to work in my kids' schools, not just on the, uh, on science, on conservation science, but also on uh, the arts. And I'll explain that more in a little bit. And um, they are now the ones teaching neighborhood kids about what you find under decaying logs or how you know what um, a mulberry tree is because we, in my home, we did raise silkworms as well. And so they got to feed um, and we decimated, sorry, a lot of mulberry trees in the neighborhood in the, um, in sacrifice, you know, for raising our um, silkworms. So it's been a great journey and one that I'm so happy to be able to continue through my job. I work at the International Programs Office of the U.S. Forest Service. And Dr. Dave works at the Northern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service as well. And Dr. Dave will talk about that later. So why are we doing this workshop? It really matters, and I'll explain this later, to be able to engage youth of all ages, especially in urban areas. And how do you do that? How do you get them engaged in conservation? How do we nurture future scientists, stewards, and voters? And then it makes you think, for those that have been, and I'm sure many of you who work with young kids, how do you, you know, make your program successful? What's the recipe for it? And lastly, and for me, the most important thing, how do we build our network together and our toolbox? I want to create a global toolbox that in, can include tools, approaches, and other resources from around the where, world and that you can take a look at and say, whoa, I never thought of that. Let me try that out with my kids. And the, this toolbox can include both approaches using technology and software or simple stuff using paper and pencil. And we'll talk about that today. And so today we're going to set the foundation. How can we grow this generation of scientists and, and stewards? And why is that important? Setting the stage and then talking about some fun examples that we've done, both Dr. Dave and myself, from, for me, I'll talk about some examples from third grade down, that's nine years old and younger. And Dr. Dave will talk about fourth grade and up. And um, we'll talk about ways to engage people. And we are not the teachers. We are just part of this whole process. We want to learn from you as well. So in the chat, keep it dynamic. Keep in, us engaged. Challenge us. We are really happy to have you. And then, to, as I mentioned, to be completed post-workshop, we are going to have some projects that we hope you'll undertake. And one of the ways to receive the certificate is to attend both sessions and to complete those projects. Again, not a heavy lift. So today, as I mentioned, we'll discuss why urban, why youth, we'll look at examples, and we'll have homework. And this is how we're going to build our network and toolbox. I keep the chat messages. I'll put the relevant um, ideas in there, transfer them over to a Google Drive. I want you to email us as well and say, hey, you know, I, I was thinking about something that you said, and it made me think about 
this creative thing that I did with young people or with adults, et cetera. So while we're focused on youth, you know, if you are, we're really about community engagement. We're really about eventually getting the entire community on board. So if you have ideas where you're working with veterans or seniors, let us know those could be applied to younger folks as well. And lastly, and I'll send out an email to all of you, please share on our Google Drive. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Dave to set the stage for who the Forest Service is. And I know we have a few people here who are part of the agency. Yeah, so the for the folks that are uh, from the agency, welcome. And we hope to introduce you to uh, some of the uh, partnerships. You know, I'm with uh, research and Liza's is with international programs. And I know we have some folks here that might be with on uh, Forest Service lands or state and private, wherever you may be from. And so the idea is the Forest Service is one of the largest land management organizations in the world. And we, um, we look at the, the multiple uses of forests, both for recreation and to raise crops. And by crops, we mean timber and lumber and wood products. And <coughs> excuse me, we're part of the US Department of Agriculture. So in fact, we are uh, looked at as production of, uh, of crops and the trees are crops that we allow people and encourage people to go out and um, explore and, and utilize uh, these forests. We have about uh, 77 million hectares of national forest land here in the US, which is a lot of land. Then we manage that and uh, on a proactive basis with our scientists, as well as our land managers and our uh, foresters. And so the idea is we extending that into urban areas also. Um, in 1999, with the, um, uh, the, the, the farm bill passed by the US Congress, we got involved in um, working in urban areas and were mandated to do that. So that's a kind of uh, a great opportunity for us to uh, reach to the people that can use and un better uh, understand our national forests and the importance and value of trees and forest lands and, and the picture of sustainability and in this uh, time of uh, the need to address global climate change. So we've been able to uh, um, pull this together over the last decades. And so Liza, as she said, she works with the international programs. I'm down with research. And the idea that we've come up with is how can we make research and bring tools like iTree? And we also have others that we're working with, StuMap and social assessment tools and some of our other products. How do we uh, get those to be um, brought out to the end users, meaning you, the people um, that are managing or impacting or using um, the lands that are around the country. And that doesn't only mean um, uh, uh, in the US, but your own countries. And the idea is looking at it from a forest standpoint, but then bringing it down and looking at um, in the urbanized area. The uh, image on your left here, you'll see, um, we have 55 million hectares of urban forests. And on the right are 77 million hectares of national forests and grasslands, but we don't manage the urban forest. We develop partnerships that we hope we can encourage partners to uh, um, from states and, and municipalities and governments and nonprofit groups to really uh, do the management. So we're providing them with tools and new technologies and products that help them to do that. And we're a partner with them. Um, so they, you know, those 55 million acres are very important, especially in, in, in today's um, need to address global climate change at the very local level. And so we have 30,000 um, folks that work with the Forest Service, not all are scientists like me, that's one of the smaller divisions actually of the Forest Service, but we work in urban programs, youth engagement, but then also in disaster response, and ecosystem services, policies, and a lot of work um, today with equity inclusion, um, working with uh, environmental justice and inclusion of non-traditional partners and looking at things from education side. So we, we work on a whole bunch of areas and important areas that um, really are providing the ability to make a difference in urban areas. So in these urban areas, we work with all audiences all ages, all abilities, and all communities. And so the idea is everybody's our partner and we wanna partner with you. And in this case here, Liza talked a little bit about extending beyond just this workshop to develop a network and a partnership so that we can exchange ideas 
and learn from you as time moves on. The best thing with iTree, I've been here since we began, is it's constantly changing and evolving to include the uh, user's needs. And that's what we're hoping with this, that you can provide us and feedback and give us um, conversation and dialogue to tell us what we can do better and what we can do to improve and ideas that are successful with you. So our idea of conservation, it's in everybody's backyard and citizen science, uh, volunteerism, uh, science delivery programs, the Youth Conservation Corps that we work with, Conservation Ed. I know we had some folks from Conservation Ed we're talking earlier here. We have a program called Discover the Forest, More Kids in the Woods. And then all of our other partnerships that we've developed is really bringing conservation to the uh, into people's hands that can most utilize it. And youth is the area that I enjoy work. I teach at the University of Massachusetts. So I, I, I work with, you know, adult youth, I guess I call them, because they're they're still young. They're mostly, uh, you know, in their up to the mid twenties, and um, they're really uh, they're the future. And it's so exciting to see a lot of uh, youth that we've worked with in in middle school. I actually have a student that I worked in middle school now is in in, in my class this semester at the university as a sophomore. So I guess I'm an old man, but I've been around a long time. But it's been such a blast to see, just like a child develops into an adult to see the youth that we've been working on developing into young scientists. They're gonna make a difference as, as we move forward. So the tools, technology, and engaging people is what we try to do. And the tool that we are using is iTree, um, the one that I'm most closely affiliated with, although I work with a bunch of other programs, but iTree is the inventory of tree resources, economic and environmental. So that's what the I tree means, inventory of tree resources, in economic and environmental. And we look to call, we like to call it in our little group here a tool for discovery, because you can learn so much about the natural systems, about ecosystem services, about the benefits trees provide, and the impact that we can have to address global climate change. And uh, what is it really? Well, it assesses the structure, meaning what do we have? The function, what are the trees and forests doing? And then the value, we uh, align that up with economic and uh, fiscal um, uh, benefits. So we're able to look in dollars and cents or yen or euros and able to look um, at the value that those services provide. So that it, it adds a little bit of value as we um, bring this out to policymakers and others. So we're not just saying, you know, trees look nice, they're pretty and they do things, but there's a, a dollar value. So we can show for every dollar we invest, we get a payback and a premium. So that's one of the neat things, the cost benefit analysis of spending a dollar and we can put that together. So some of the tools that we use internationally are iTree Canopy, iTree Eco, and what we're focusing on in the next two weeks is MyTree. And do you need a lot of technology to uh, teach this to your students? No. You're, um, we're going to be teaching the principles, and the idea here is I'm going to show you some local, I'm, I'm so cheap, and I have no budget, and um, my budget is seized at the beginning of the year and goes to our uh, programmers, so there's very little left, so when I'm working with, you know, uh, partners and things, I try to do it the least expensive way, and, you know, especially our international partners, we've been uh, really successful in bringing uh, useful tools to them that they can make for very little investment on their part. And then which is the easiest tool to use with my tree? iTree? It's, it's my tree. And when we go to the website, um, you'd see it just says the easiest tool. And right there, it has my, my tree jumping out yet, uh, for you to try. So we're gonna try to uh, show you how to use this as we move uh, forward over the next week. Um, excuse me, the um, iTree suite of tools, we have about nine different tools within iTree. And I showed you that several can be used internationally, but we have about 600,000 users worldwide in over 130 countries. And we're really proud of that. Over the last 11 years, we've been able to develop this uh, cadre of people and uh, really a, a, a group of folks that see the merit in using scientific tools to tell a story. And so that's, we're really proud and myself as a scientist to bring science into the hands of um, users of all 
ages, types, and, and, and disciplines. So um, as we move forward, you're going to see some of that, and we're going to be bringing this to you over the next few weeks or the next week, and you'll have the idea that, wow, you're part of a, a, a bigger um, thing. This national and international community is, is starting to gel, and we're hoping that you can help to uh, be part of that as we move forward over the next couple of years. And Liza and I, uh, that's going to be the focus. And by then I might be retiring, but we'll see. Um, but the idea is uh, we're so excited and I continue to be excited as um, one of the older folks uh, on the iTree team, having been here since its in inception. But Liza, I'll share, I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Are you going to stop? You, you can share, right? You're going to do the thoughts and mm -hmm. move over to the next slide. So I'll, I'll just step back and let you uh, continue. But don't be afraid to add your thoughts into the um, chat too, because that's very important. And folks are reading it as we go. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dave. And for those that are only learning about iTree today, um, well, let me step back. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with the Davy Tree Expert Company, Arbor Day Foundation, International Society for Ar Arbor Culture, Casey Trees. And together, um, we've developed and continue to upgrade and maintain this amazing tool um, since its inception about 15, 16 years ago. and. I think over time, we're really getting it from the hands of uh, researchers and academics and traditional foresters into our communities. So for those who have gone through the academy, we do run an academy every year, an international academy. Um, there's also a national one, a domestic one. Those that have taken it or are taking it, and I know that some of you have, uh, some of you in the group, um, let us know, can iTree, what do you think? Can iTree be taught to kids? And why should we expose young people to tools like iTree? So place that in the chat, send us an email or put it in the drive of, and let us know what you think. So I'm going to talk about um, exposure and engagement of young people before the age of nine. And I'm a firm believer that conservation is a language like anything else. And if you learn it at a young age, you become fluent at it and you might even teach others in the same language. But before I go into the examples of what we can do with kids between the ages of three and four, all the way to uh, nine years of age, I wanna set the stage of why Dr. Dave and I work in urban spaces and why we're interested particularly in youth and especially urban youth. So many of you know that more than half of the world's population already lives in cities. We're not just talking about the giant metropolises out there, Gotham City, um, Chicago, or Manila or Bangkok you know, or um, Dar es Salaam. We're talking about every type of, whether it's tertiary or primary city, people are moving. And the thing is by 2050, that number is going to increase to 70% of the global population. Yes, we had a pandemic and lockdown and many, as been noted, many have moved back to rural um, areas. However, it's not enough to slow down the, this increasing, rapidly increasing trend. In the United States, Canada, and Mexico, we're already at 80%. When the Forest Service was first established back in 1905, 70% of uh, the population in the United States lived in rural areas. So check this out, and over 100 years later, the script has been flipped. And so if we want to work where people live with the motto of caring for the land and serving the people, you have to work where they live. This is a staggering statistic for me. According to the UN United Nations Habitat Report, one out of eight people live below the poverty line, most of them in informal settlements. So you know, just keep that in mind. Keep in mind that rapidly growing uh, urban population and then 
layer this information on top of it, that by 2030, 2030 being this somehow magic number that in eight years, you know, if we don't address climate change, for example, that it's Armageddon. And of course, I'm being a little, uh, overly dramatic in, in that, stating that case. However, by 2030, 60% of the world's population of urban dwellers will be under the age of 18. That's a huge number. If you think about the young workforce, how many of them are unemployed and what conservation uh, can do in the hands of young people, whether it's with respect to the economy, economy with green jobs, or whether it's talking about conservation messages and actually doing something about it. So I wanna tell a little story. I'm one of those moms that will tell my kids, Keep your door open, don't, don't close it. And yes, I'm gonna speak a little bit and whisper a little right now because they can probably hear me. I do listen in on their conversations. And during the pandemic, when my uh, 14, now 14 year old was talking through his headphones with his friends, I was shocked. Some of their big messages was like, hey man, you know, have you heard of this climate change? I think we're doomed. That is, they were talking about it, not just in one session, but multiple times over across the, eight, uh, the year during the pandemic. Cl that climate anxiety is sitting in with them. And many of them will come to me because in the neighborhood, I've known as that, the green lady, the forest lady, they'll come to me and say, is there anything we can do? Can we do something? And that is a powerful request from kids that many of us believe are just on their videos and on their smartphones or don't really care about much. They care. So how do we harness that? This is a beautiful quote from um, a report from the UN. Can our children inherit an urban future that is greener, safer, healthier, and inclusive? And I challenge everyone can, with this question, can we grow and nurture change makers, future scientists, future stewards, and most importantly, future voters? By 2030, most of them will be um, you know, going into uh, public service. Many of them will be voting. And with the right concepts and with this taking in that climate anxiety that I talked about, taking in the idea of messaging about conservation, they're going to change and be the change makers of the future. So international programs where I work, works in over 90 countries worldwide. Now we have about 300 people in our staff all around the world and while many of these countries where they live don't have mandates um, to work in or manage urban forests, our work, especially with respect to youth, is through partnerships, as Dr. Dave has mentioned, through convening and building networks like the one we're doing now, by bringing tools and approaches overseas, and then also learning from our partners worldwide. And so where do we, the first step is, and I think, those of you who are here um, may be doing this already. Are you working or volunteering in schools? So that's the, just the first step. Clearly, if you don't have children um, in some places around the world, like the United States, you can't just go into a school and say, hey, can I work with kids and teach soil science? You may be able to, but there are policies in place to protect. So if not, why? Again, I mentioned some of those challenges. If you have them, please them in the chat about what, you, even if it's your own personal um, challenges of, well, I'm scared to work with kids. Put it in the chat, let us know. And if you have those challenges, then how do we engage youth? So I wanna talk about my personal principle, um, which is building a staircase of learning and layering the learning. And so I'll talk a little bit about those principles. And I think, you know, you can add to these principles. Oh, that. That's my goal. If we can just mute ourselves. Um, and then I'll talk about some examples. So this is the layering of the learning that once you've gotten them interested, how do you then 
couple that with other things, whether it's public service, whether it's involving the community or having them, you know, it's the ultimate train the trainers, teach the kids and hopefully they'll be teaching others. I also believe firmly in this, that it's not a STEM thing to talk about conservation science whatsoever. It's a STEAM thing. It's about science and spirituality. It's about bringing in technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics. You can have the most technical thing, but if you're not communicating it well, you're not engaging your community. You can talk about dendro dendrochronology. Learned that one day and I thought, why are you writing that in a, in a non-academic journal? Just say tree rings and the timeline with tree rings. Make it palatable, make it easy for people to connect with you. So how do we do that? By starting in your own backyard. It's great, we have a lot of resources for kids to be able to encourage them to go and hike in the woods. But the, sometimes it's really more important to just to get them to appreciate the little butterfly that lands on their balcony or window. Have them start in their backyard. Have them work with their smaller, concentric, if you talk about concentric circles and spheres of influence, that's where you begin. And then expose them. Do you see my son on the right side there holding the Madagascar hissing cockroach? He was seven. He came with us to a science fair that a school was having and he was teaching other kids his age and older to not be afraid of the insects and the live animals that we had been uh, bringing to the school. He was teaching them to hold the Madagascar cockroach in their hands. I love that. And I love the exposure that a lot of expos provide because it's this idea that it's fun. It's a, almost like a festival. It's hands on and their curiosities are um, encouraged and piqued. And when that happens, they hone our curiosity because they ask the best questions. And many of you have heard of inquiry-based learning, which is get the kids to answer, to ask questions and you ask, you know, instead of answering them, answer it with questions as well. And it becomes this really dynamic um, exchange. The other thing that I love about these kinds of fairs and expos and um, you know, really working with kids is the hands-on nature of things. So as you can see on the bottom right, the picture there is Eureka. We developed this with the BioBus in New York City. This is in Amman, Jordan, and it's a mobile conservation science classroom. And it's tricked out inside. There's a rail rainfall simulator, there are iPads, Kids come in, they're playing with them. And this van, this vehicle goes all around Jordan, including to the communities in the Eastern desert where a lot of them have been internally or externally displaced. And so for them to be able to just, you know, they have other priorities, but just to be able to go and just touch things, sometimes in a lot of countries, I can speak to this because in my small little country of my hometown in the Philippines, in Surigao, books have to be covered. And sometimes a lot of gadgets that come into the school, you're not allowed to touch them. And so there's always this barrier for many people around the world. So, what, so this kind of bus, this minivan, as well as the boat that you see on the upper left corner, which is the Red Sea Defender based in the Red Sea in, uh, around Hurghada, uh, Egypt allows people, allows youth in particular to be very curious and to explore. And what I loved about the Red Sea Defender is that our work there is to encourage the young people in the communities that live across from these high-end resorts. But these communities don't even know what's in the Red Sea. And so we bring them on the boat we get them on these inflatable rafts just to look at and scoop up um, specimens or seawater. They bring it back and there are scientists on board who are actually doing their PhD in academic research. And we're tying science and engagement together. This is uh, a project that I worked on similar to Eureka and Red Sea Defender. This is in Kigali in Rwanda. And we work with Royal, um, 
I'm sorry, the Ru Rwandan Wildlife Conservation Association. And in our efforts to help preserve the endangered red crown crane, we're, we created the Crane Cruiser in a similar fashion to Eureka, but with a focus on biodiversity conservation. And this goes out, so until, this hasn't been shipped out yet because then the pandemic started, but we're hoping to get this over to Rwanda pretty soon. We talked about connecting young people through uh, emotionally and spiritually. For most of us around the world, 90% of the world's population has some sort of spiritual, philosophical, or religious foundation. And this is one way to connect with them, either through festivals, to a particular deity, or through nature walks, or just for kids to be able to touch the soil and teach them it's not dirt and to have an, an emotional connection with them. We also do that through wonder and joy by bringing live animals to school. So some of our programs at international programs is to teach kids about how urban areas are stopover sites and critical sites for a lot of migratory animals. And so we bring in, um, monarch butterflies and teach them to raise larvae or we do have a program using bats, um, the insects that come in, the arthropods, we, uh, as well as non-releasable rehabilitated raptors. Um, and we have all of that as well. And that's something that has brought so much joy to young people, but also uh, in terms of messaging, allows them to say, allows them to understand what it means to conserve a habitat and why. I believe too strongly that networks are not just for adults. Networks are also for kids. They already have their groups and squads, right? And, um, but a scientific network for kids that are young through either citizen science really helps create a sense of belonging for a lot of kids. Um, for children that don't have the opportunity to attend camp because it is expensive, Sometimes having peer groups talk about or work on conservation projects is almost like camp. So in my neighborhood, again, I am the tree lady, the forest lady. Um, every summer, my kids and I put together a camp for our neighborhood kids, and it is so rewarding. Sometimes we'll use, it's really kind of dirty, like one of those Broadway musicals like Hamilton, and have them rap. And, and say, okay, now I challenge you to take that same rap and put conservation messages in, and then we'll put a production on. It's been really great. I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And then we want them, we want the kids, the kids are a great gateway into bringing the rest of the community in, involving families in Chicago, where my colleague Mike Rizzo works, he involves the families. Um, there's a network through the Head Start program where mothers or parents rather and grandparents are involved in raising cater monarch caterpillars, monarch larvae, and then releasing them into the neighborhood. Um, then you involve the neighborhood themselves and then involving the non-traditional partners out there the local lawmakers, the spiritual leaders, community leaders, shopkeepers even, or as they say, in, like in Delhi, underneath the canopy of the people tree, you can engage the barber, the shopkeeper, et cetera, into conservation. And then we teach the kids to pay it forward. Whether we're asking adults through teacher trainings and, and mentorship with kids, or whether or not we ask the children ask the youth to teach others through train the trainers, but making it less formal sounding. It's a really great way, not just for them to really be fluent on the messaging, but to bring peers into their circle. So I'm going to talk about now some ideas that I've done with third grade and, uh, and younger, and many of you might have more ideas. I'm pretty sure you do. And these are just some of the things that I've done Maybe it might inspire you to, you know, take it home with you. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the 
key messages that we bring to children is um, in ecosystem services, but that is such a mouthful, even for an adult like me. Uh, so we, so I asked them, what are the superpowers of trees? They resonate with that more. Trees are superheroes. And so some of the things that we do it, are things like the tree lay race, which is one of the activities we do with the crane crews here in Rwanda. You can use paper, a chalkboard, et cetera, and you have kids run and come up with as many ideas as possible. And then they look at the finished product of that list and they, are, they get really surprised and it never fails um, about what can come from trees and what services trees provide. So here's the thing, that list grows even more when adults run with the kids as well as part of the tree lay race. We also create trees. So some of you might have this in your kids' classrooms, but you can create this in your neighborhood as either a semi-permanent or ephemeral um, uh, fixture and just have kids, even using a sticky note or piece of paper, write in on a leaf and watch their tree grow. Again, it's pretty easy to prepare, low to medium cost. You can do any, you can use this any way you want. Something that's really low cost and something that may seem boring is what I call meet the greens, where we ask kids to walk around, observe, write, and draw. Have them create a map of their neighborhood. It's a precursor to eye tree canopy, to take a look at and draw what's in their neighborhood. Then we ask them to get up close and personal with what's underneath the tree, what's in the tree. Go ahead and climb the tree if you want and with your parents' permission, or roll that rock over under that tree and see what's there. One of the things that I just learned from a partner in India was um, every, for every festival, they put out pujas candles and offerings under the tree. And sometimes they also put flour uh, as part of their festival, like milled flour. And kids were noticing that flour, which may seem innocuous, which may seem harmless, was actually causing the tree trunks to be eaten by rats. So those were young people observing that and letting us know that. So already that's citizen science right there. This is another low cost one. And Dr. Dave will talk about this later where you're asking kids to go and do tree identification, but also to really look at a tree and say, is it healthy? Why do you think it's not healthy? And so sometimes I have kids still ask me today that is a tree healthy in the autumn when its leaves are gone? So these are great con conversation questions about conservation. This is an example of a map making project that uh, somebody had done and you can encourage kids to do this any way they want but what they quickly see is oh boy we don't have that many trees at all in our neighborhood and then we can teach them like some of the principles that are being espoused out there is that you want to have a, at least 30 percent canopy in any given area we have this right now so that encourages the mathematics as well demonstration so i made this for an expo uh, with my then four-year-old, three, um, three two-liter bottles. And as you can see, it's a fantastic demonstration. From left to right, the number, amount of vegetation goes down to zero. We have kids pour water in. You can see it's quick demonstration that you can see if the water that comes out is filtered. You ask the kids, do you want to swim in that water? And they quickly make the deduction about how vegetation can slow down erosion and help filter water that comes in. And so uh, for this one, I'll put this in our resource on the Google Drive and um, we can, and you can take a look at how, about how to make it. And this can be done in various ways. Would love to hear from all of you about how you would show and prepare something like this. Pollution, sky to soils. That's my younger son on the right. And when he was in daycare, uh, we worked with the daycare using clay and plastics, et cetera, to create a watershed. But you don't see on the left-hand side, 
are many cities um, and then a bay. And what we did was we poured dirty water, which is really like fruit juice, et cetera. And we poured it over and we watched how it streamed, how it flowed downstream and asked the questions, yes, there are four, but they were able to answer, um, where does the water go? And they were able to answer that question. They were able to make really good deductions at an early age. The sewer in a suitcase is from New York City. That's on the top left. And the bottom left is uh, who polluted our waters narrative. And so in this case, you give all your uh, participants tiny vials or containers that contain things that represent actual pollutants. And you tell a story. And as you're telling the story, when they hear their pollutant, they come running to this fresh bowl of water and they start dumping what they have in there. And there is a fake goldfish in the water. And at the end of the story, we let them tell us adults what happened with this water and what they can do about it. Again, I can put this, all these things in the Google Drive. So here are some other fun ideas. Um, this is one of my favorites so that I've created with the kids on the left is eco, an eco light. So for those that don't want to or can't afford to have electricity all day, um, just using bleach and water within a plastic bottle, attaching it to the top of a ceiling. Um, in this case, it's in a cardboard box and they look through a little hole in the cardboard box and they see how refraction um, with re how the light is refracted and goes to all areas and you don't even have to use up electricity. Same thing with the one in the middle, which is the eco cooler or eco air conditioner. Again, it's the principle of the air cooling down as it's passing through a narrow space and you can blow a fan of warm air across it and they try to feel what it feels like on, um, on one side, on the other side of the fan. And then lastly, this is a fun project with my kids. It's an eco refrigerator, which are really two nested uh, clay pots with wet uh, sand in between them. You place a small uh, glass of water or a can of soda and then a wet cloth on top and let evapotranspiration work. And a few hours later, you'll see the temperature drop. We also had a thermometer in ours. And so they drank the cold fizzy soda after and saw that it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit or about 10 degrees Celsius. I'm not really sure about that, maybe five degrees Celsius. So that was another fun project. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I not only volunteer my time teaching conservation science at schools, but I also do art and art history. And so combining that together has been really fun. And these are some of the ephemeral projects that we do with kids based on artists like Patrick Doherty or Andy Goldsworthy, where we walk in nature and we create cairns or stone statues or leave uh, projects. It's, um, it at least encourages and invites those that are not necessarily science minded to become scientists because our message is always you all are scientists. This is another fun one which is a precursor to rapid social assessment and we get kids to be detectives take a look at a space and say oh how is this space being used I'm seeing some tracks over here are those footprints of animals what kind of animals walking through there what's under this log just really fun, it's urban hiking. We also do um, projects where we uh, speak to a kid's youth needs to, to help the environment. So whether it's composting or recycling or putting something in waste or upcycling it, we um, work with them on that as well. Easy to prepare materials and instructions on the Google Drive. Here are some examples of upcycling projects. These are from the internet, and these are from some of our friends. <coughs> Excuse me, this one is from Delhi, India. They took a lot of things from the uh, landfills and created some of these projects. And now 
want to talk to you about some of my favorite things, which is in Melbourne, Australia, the communities were asked to, community members were asked to email a tree. It's a little bit akin to adopting a tree, but you can email a tree. And it's creating that bond right there. And when I heard about this and started reading all these emails, it actually made me chuckle and in some cases made me laugh. <coughs> and here we're adopting a tree. <coughs> Sorry. And so here we are with my kids. That's the end of my portion. We'd love to hear from you. Please share your thoughts and before we go on break. Okay, guys, that was great. And we have a few questions that have not questions, but we're going to get you the uh the uh Google Drive link. Uh Liza is going to send out a, an email to everybody. It'll probably be coming out um you know, tomorrow, because we're in the eastern U.S., and it's going to be 10 o'clock by the time we're done. So, Liza, um, and, and Liza's voice is going because she's been presenting all day, um, not only our workshop, but another one. So, she's been busy and um, hard work and, and a lot of speaking. But um, it's great to see if you have other thoughts, you can add those into the um, into the uh, chat. And, you know, people has commented a lot of um connection to some of the work that you've done and um that's so exciting to hear so Liza, do you want to take a break or do you want does the audience want a break a three minute break or do we want to just um move right into the next section i think a break would be great um maybe just if there are any questions right now uh, we entertain just a couple and then um dr dave and i will be around during the break and if you you know we'll take a five minute break right after are there any questions or comments or feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, who, uh, uh, somebody uh, started out taking their uh, son on, um, you know, tree assessment or uh, tree inventory at age seven. And I said, a great age to start. And um, uh, yeah, that was uh, Lucrea and she's taking her son to help conduct tree surveys and he's seven. So never too soon to start. And then there was another comment in here about technologies and um, a lot of folks can't afford technologies and you'll find that here in the US, but also around the world, you know, smartphones are still a luxury in, 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 in many countries, but also in many um, communities right here in the US because of economic challenges and, um, and some of the ages that we work with. So. I'm going to show you a few things that in, in my presentation that will talk about um, low cost with no technology. And then we're going to give you a little assignment to do over the weekend or between now and next week that has really no technology involved, um, except uh, maybe getting a Google map or something like that. But the idea is technology we understand um, is every day becomes more and more widely distributed and affordable, um, but we still have to take into account, you know, I'm headed into Boston tomorrow into one of Boston's poorest neighborhoods here in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, I realize that, most, and, and, and I'm working with kids that are uh, um, 17 to 24, and only half of the 26 people actually own cell phones. And it's just an affordability thing. Um, so, um, but we'll try to save you some money in the presentation I'm going to give you in a few minutes. And, and you know, again, depending on the demographic that you work with, the income levels, et cetera, um, all these things can be layered together. Uh, if you don't, if you can't work with technology, we're hope, we hope that we've provided some inspiration for other activities that you can do. And yeah. Go ahead. Um, I... no, go ahead, Dr. Dave. No, I was just going to say, um, Siobhan, I hope I'm proud of your name right, but uh, you'll find uh, sometimes technology can be difficult outside with sun and lots of kids. Well, you know, it's lots of kids can cause a lot of commotion, so you really need to be focused. And then you know how the sun uh, reflecting off of, a, you know, an, a tablet or a smartphone or even a laptop. It's it's sometimes impossible to read, and if, if you're... Um, 
you know, have any difficulty seeing and you can't get the contrast quite right, sometimes that's really difficult. I just find that with my students complain about that too. And, you know, a lot of those that in, in college, when I send them out with uh, doing various projects, because I like to embrace technology. Most of my students at the University of Mass, Massachusetts, um, they all have smartphones and we'll give them tablets or iPads or whatever they need. Um, but they do come in complaining and, you know, technology sometimes doesn't work when it's raining out. And um, that's another thing to consider. You know, I, I love working outdoors and, you know, any kind of weather, whether it be raining or snowing and um, we got to get the work done. So uh, sometimes you're going to have to uh, revert to something that you can do on, you know, um, uh, you know, with um, rain, uh, work in the rain notebooks and things like that. So um, it's all a challenge, but it's all exciting. And that's what makes it, um, you know, um, uh, something for us to really get into. And hopefully you're going to, um, this is going to whet your appetite on using uh, my tree, I tree and, and beyond. And especially with the youth that we can um, sort of turn uh, your heads to say, okay, well, I need to work with some youth. That's right. Thanks, Dr. Dave. And with that, let's take a five minute break, everybody. Um, grab yourself your morning cup of coffee or late night tea and join us again in five minutes. I see some friends here, Dr. Dave. Uh, I'm just trying to look at the attendance. I didn't have a chance to look. <clears throat> Let's see. We've got Lucrecia, hi. Fabiola is here. Christian Sawyer is here, don't we? Christian, don't, do I know you? Yes, right? You were in our iTree Academy? No? I think that's a different Kristen. Okay. Um, not sure, but Fabi is here. We've got- Hi, Fabiola. Hi. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah. And, I thought, uh, Al, thought Alzheimer was gonna pop in for a minute. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. So Fabi, is, uh, also, you're doing some work on youth engagement, right? I think, is it it's only in Merida or also Merida and um, in La Paz and other places? Um, I think only in Merida. What age group? Um, with uh, children of like nine years old and or more. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it, with, in La Paz, it's really strictly through the Stumap I tree intersection. Is that right? Yeah, could be an option after yeah. the, the assessment we, we can do, uh, things like that. Perfect. Yeah. Particularly in Merida, eh, we apply uh, to create uh, the tree with the benefits and show it to, to, to the to children. Make yeah. sure you keep us informed. We want to hear all about your journey there. I think it's so <laughs> exciting. And this is at Tanan Cub, is that correct? Or? Yeah, it's Tanan Cub and Geo. Yeah. Perfect. That's so great. How's it going? Did you, how's the uh, forum going or is it finished already? Yeah. Uh, it hasn't finished because um, we begin to make some uh, videos and some activities with a uh, community, but uh, it was along 2020. Mm -hmm. So we have some difficulties because uh, the pandemic, so it was a difficult time. We, can, we uh, got to stop. Mm -hmm. And now the idea is to continue to do some activities like that, but uh, Kanankab ha is having um, a process, uh, well, the director of this NGO changed, so it yeah, was changed. So we are now connected again with Kanankab and we're, uh, uh, we're seeing if... Uh, we're, up, um, we're thinking about how to continue 
this collaboration, uh, but we are uh, in a process of waiting that the new integrators of Canon Cap uh, tell us if they uh, think they, get, they can continue with the collaboration or not. So uh, that has been something difficult, but the idea is to uh, continue with the process because in that project, uh, firstly, we made a social uh, survey well, uh, we applied a, a survey in a neighborhood. Uh, so we want to know our, the perception of people about trees mm -hmm. and uh, if they think they, uh, they have uh, a trees near of their home or things like that. And they, if they can mention some benefits and also some uh, things that, uh, disagree about trees mm -hmm. and after that uh, we begin to uh, work with um, um, with children mm -hmm. and to show the uh, value of trees the benefits and also we work an activity um, where children um, can um, get uh, leaves or parts of, of a tree and try to recognize them and, and um, make like a book with this uh, parts of trees, different trees. Also, uh, we begin to uh, develop uh, like, um, um, I don't know, get information about the, the main species that are, uh, that occurs in that, um, in the land park. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the idea is having this information about, for example, um, cultural aspects or uses of these uh, trees, native trees, mm -hmm. and uh, combine this with the results of iTree Eco. Okay. Uh, yeah. Canon made a tree inventory of some of these trees, uh, more common species um, located in this uh, area. Uh, the main park of this uh, located in in this neighborhood. So the idea is that this information about uh, the value of benefits, we can integrate with more information about the species mm. use, uses and make like a tree trial or uh, that was the idea. But now we are, uh, we have the, the results of iTree, yeah. but we need the collaboration, the NGO. That's right. Yeah. So. And uh, that's meant, that's funny you mentioned about the tree identification. D Dr. Davis is actually going to talk about that. But uh, what I want to end with before we uh, get off of break is this. So as you know, next October is the World Forum on Urban Forest. It's the second one that FAO is putting together. One of the things that um, they're really looking at that they didn't look at in 2018 is actually youth engagement. You yeah. have a great case study because you're bringing together technology and tools, NGO involvement, but also forest communication. The Forest Communicators, Communicators Network uh, and Rachel and Emily will probably tell you about that we have a working group under the North American Forest Commission. Forest Communicators Network is looking exactly at this, the cultural aspects of trees, but also the initial perception. Not everybody thinks trees are good. Not everybody think that a forest or a park is good. Some find it quite intimidating or scary. So um, before you can change, before you can engage people, you've got to really address what it is that people yeah. are, or how they see their natural resources, and then help and guide them to change a narrative. So you know, think about this with Emily and uh, Myra is here, I think, and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of a case study to present next year? Yeah, I think we have some interesting results because in the social assessment, uh, we identified that there are some relations between, uh, I don't know, for example, people that uh, uh, the things that are, or uh, the trees are not having a good condition is people that lives uh, 
um, well, the like the houses are located uh, um, far away from the line park, for example. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. people that live near of this park thinks the trees are better, thinks that yeah. the trees are uh, they have enough trees, something like that. Yeah. It's it's something that, that we are now analyzing, but um, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Bobby. I'm sorry to cut you results. off. I'm sorry to cut you off. We are uh, quite three minutes after break now, but let's continue this discussion. I really want to hear more about this, and I want to share this, you know, widely. Um, I think there's a lot of meat there, um, and for everybody just joining us back from. Um, uh, break we, before we go on to Dr. Dave's presentation. We're talking about how people perceive trees. And yes, that is a really important part, not just for adults, but also how young kids perceive trees. It, I started off with saying trees are superheroes, right? But maybe to some, it's a scary thing. In some countries around the world, like where I grew up, for example, uh, you don't go near the rubber tree. It's scary. It's the devil's tree. If it gets, you know, we, so in many cases, you stay away from it. And so, what does, how does that affect perception? So, I wanted to put that out there. Um, Dr. Dave, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, you're going to have to stop sharing yours. Okay, there we go. There you go. Take it away. Okay, hang on one second. I just got to switch this. Okay, great. Um, you can see the uh, full screen. So what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about, and I'm gonna try to um, get through this uh, as um, seamlessly as we can. Um, don't forget to add your thoughts to the uh, chat and we'll try to just carry on with some ideas and um, things looking at older kids from fourth, sixth, uh, sixth, eighth, and through high school. So the one thing with my tree and with the entire iTree suite, my tree is the easiest, simplest tool to use. We can use it for a wide range of users from students all the way to professionals. Um, and we can give accurate reporting on ecosystem services of trees and the value of trees. And it's ideal for educa uh, environmental education at all grade levels. So that's what's exciting about it for us to be able to be used. And I use it with college students, but today we're talking about youth. One of the neat things about this, um, we're talking about technology earlier, but um, it's iTree on the go for individual or multiple trees. So we can use it on a smartphone or we can use it on a, a tablet or we can use it on our laptop. And so it's adaptable to this wide range of users. Here's a bunch of college kids that are all well versed in how to use their smartphones. And then, but all the way down to kids that um, might not have any of the technology. And here's some kids are looking at a, uh, a tree identification um, key to help them identify what tree they're looking at. And we're gonna have to, uh, actually, you're gonna have to do some of this when you're working with uh, um, youth and other folks also, um, because they might not know how to identify a tree or the difference between a, uh, you know, a palm or a, a sassafras. So the idea is we're gonna give them some tools and we'll talk to you a little bit about that today and next week. And then here's some of my, uh, um, uh, kids here. These kids are in sixth grade and my three college students in the front middle. That was this summer where we worked on a, pro a program called Off to the Great Outdoors. And my tree um, and I tree was a, a key component of what we did when we worked with the kids for uh, 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 six weeks on uh, out in the great outdoors. So it's kind of cool. And then international users, my tree is well suited for your, um, international users like we have a uh, a, a bunch of you today on the call. And that's what's so exciting is bringing this around, not only um, in the US, but internationally to countries around the world. So uh, MyTree is uh, a, a tool that we are really um, are excited about. We've just come out with release 2.0 and we'll be talking about that next week. I have a little demonstration of the earliest versions that we came out with, but it can be used by professionals also. So you'll use the same tool that many professionals are actually using in the field today. Because what a better, easier way to show clients on the professional side or um, policymakers or politicians or uh, managers or designers, the value of trees and, and what it means when we have to remove a tree or what if we plant a tree. 
So we look at the idea of looking at my tree as a tool for exploration, learning, and science. So we're combining a bunch of different disciplines, and the idea here is to create future scientists. And my tree, in the um, ultimate goal of it, is to provide usable data and outputs that we can all use, whether you be an individual teacher, a student, or a practicing professional. The idea is to produce information. In this case here, it was a Chinese elm tree. And we can look at the, uh, uh, the tree nutrition label, I call it, but it's an output here that talks about the amount of carbon dioxide, storm water, air pollution removed, energy used, um, a variety of different ecosystem services rated or calculated by ounces, pounds, tons, or dollars, or whatever kind of currency you uh, want to use. So, um, and we can take this information and we can turn it into a lot of things that provide and tell a story. So one of the key things with this is data collection. And you're gonna have a um, little assignment this weekend to go out and collect a little bit of data to get started. But um, uh, one of our students on the left there, you see he's using a diameter breast height tape, a DBH tape, and he's measuring, we're teaching him how to use and measure the circumference of a tree and convert that to a diameter. So kids will not only learn about trees, they're gonna learn about math, they're gonna learn a little bit about geometry, we're gonna learn a little bit about um, uh, physics and a variety of other things, even at the youngest age, but the idea is these are transferable all the way into professional life. So um, you see the uh, commercial arborist on the right measuring DBH of a tree with the same tool that we're uh, you know, letting the kids try out and use. And one of the ideas is kids can't always buy one of these $22, $24 DBH tapes. So we'll help them to uh, make some of your own. And so the goal is um, you might, uh, DBH is just a standard measure. I just wanna make sure everyone's on the same page. DBH is a, a diameter at breast height where we measure four and a half feet from the ground. Um, we would measure the diameter of the tree and a DBH tape, tape will actually convert the circumference, the distance around a tree into a diameter because diameter is a standard measure that we use. And from a scientific standpoint, that's how we can track the growth of trees, looking at DBH changing over time. So in the picture up here, you'll see uh, up top, there's a caliper, which is another way to measure DBH. And then there's two orange DBH tapes there that convert the circumference to the diameter. But then at the bottom is one that we make with the kids. It's just made out of a, a, a simple surveyor's flagging and we measure off using a, a, a ruler or a yardstick and we mark every inch and we're creating a, 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 a very inexpensive one roll of the uh, 300 feet of flagging tape. We can make um, 30 to 40 uh, DBH tapes that the kids can take out into the field and actually use. And the cost of that you know, is, is less than $3. So um, very affordable. And here's some of the students um, this past summer actually making DBH tapes. You'll see they stretch it out and they have a, uh, actually in this case, we're using a tape measure, but they also use a ruler and this uh, a yardstick on the, the ones on the right and they mark off every inch with a, um, a Sharpie marker and really create the tool that they're gonna use. And, um, and that's how we teach them and have them understand that what they're gonna be doing out in the field. So as our student on the left had the expensive you know $27 unit, well, now we have the 80 cent unit here that one of our kids has hanging around his neck. Very excited to be recording the information. I'm not sure his assistant was as excited, but um, in this case, you'll see, it's just a, a pretty cool way for the kids to actually make the tool they're gonna use in the field. And another thing we do is this is measuring tree height. Okay, so we have the students go out on little adventures and they, look for the largest diameter tree, but we also have them look for the tallest tree. And in order to do that, this is a clinometer, and that's a, a really um, uh, expensive scientific instrument that uh, the one on the left costs about 90 bucks, um, a forestry tool. So I, we don't have $90 to spend. So what we do is, and, and, and there's a more expensive $140 one there in yellow in US dollars, and then a $16 one made out of plastic that's more affordable. But why not look at the one on the bottom that we make with uh, just a simple protractor, a straw, some tape, a little string, and a bolt or a nut on the end. 
and we're able to use that to measure the tree height. Um, just doing simple calculations of the uh, distance away from the tree, a 45 degree angle you'll see right here. We mark the 45 degree angle. The student looks through the straw and once the, uh, the string is at 45 degree angle, um, their partner will tell them. So they'll stop because you'll be backing up from the tree and looking up until you hit that 45 degree angle. And then the distance to the tree and then we can triangulate that and, and it'll create and give us a determination of the height of the tree. It's really cool. It's easy to use. The kids love it. And, you know, this whole thing costs you uh, about a dollar fifty by the time you uh, purchase one. Um, and, you know, there's protractors all around in schools and other, uh, um, you know, other classes, geometry class. You might be able to borrow them and because you can take it right apart, just simply taping it together. And so we give the information on how to do this. And, and so we give you, um, you know, more information. And this one here, it's just, uh, um, we, we, we give these to the students. We go through it as sort of a uh, in-class work uh, case before we go outside and they know how to use it and they can't wait to get outside to, to, uh, to use it. And so that's just another one that I like. And then we want to measure different things out in the field. And, you know, sometimes this 100 foot DBH tape, we need to measure how far away we are from the tree in order to triangulate with a 45 degree angle. Well, we all can't afford to go out and buy a 100 foot DBH tape. And not all kids know enough how to pace off, you know, three foot increments. Well, they're smaller and shorter, so they're probably not three foot. But um, if you take a surveying class, one of the key things they teach you is how to pace off distance. But we um, in this case here, you know, the, the tape is easier. So what we do is we make our own little tape just by getting some uh, paracord. You know, that's a 300 foot roll of paracord and some duct tape. And then just sort of every, uh, we stretch it out. Oops. And every 10 feet, we put an orange mark. Okay, so then I stretch that out and we make an 80 foot tape here. So we have eight marks and we can measure between 10 foot increments and we can estimate, okay, I have four marks. I know I'm 40 feet away from the tree, but this thing here is cost you another four, $4 and, and you can make several of them with the 300 foot tape. I mean the 300 foot uh, paracord. So the idea is the kids actually make these and how cool is that, that they're making their own tools. So right there, you have three tools that they can take right out into the field and you know we're under five dollars in expense. And here's another one: uh, compasses. The kids, um, you know, this is a compass here. They'll run you about forty bucks. Um, and so the other thing we're doing is we're just simply working with the kids here. We set up a bowl of water with a a, a cork and um, uh, uh, this is just a sewing pin, and that's going to uh, help us to um, uh, determine the north because we magnetize the the uh, pin and it points to north. Once we determine where north is, then we um, we have a uh, outdoor classroom sign that we'll put out. Um, and you may be able to do this with your kids if you actually have a chance to do this. So everybody knows which way north or east, whatever direction, the main direction we're looking at. And then we'll put it on a tripod or on an easel. And so everybody knows what they're looking at. But the kids can make the sign. And then we only need one compass or using... Um, uh, other methods like the cork and the uh, uh, pin to come up with where north is. And from there, we can uh, know where the rest of the directions are. Because one of the things in my tree, we need you um, in order to calculate energy savings, we ask you to um, uh, tell us the, the direction from the tree back to a building or a structure. So we need to know where north is if you want to calculate energy savings. So this helps the kids to do that. This is a, an area that stumps a lot of folks, but you make it more complicated than it generally needs to be. Okay, so tree identification. We know that the kids aren't going to be able to go out and figure out 50 different kind of trees or even 30 different kind of trees. But what you can do when you're working with youth is to go out and pre-sample and to go out to the area or the site, the location, whether it be the schoolyard or a park, and pre-sample what kind of trees you have there. And then you can put together um, the, uh, um, this is just another book we have here in the US for only a few dollars. You can get inexpensive books, but you can put together something like this we did. It's just an iTree, uh, I mean, iTree, Tree ID reference sheet 
or booklet we put together. And the front page of this has um, the shape of leaves. Okay, so the kids start to learn some terminology. But if I have, we're going to look at uh, 10 trees in our little work this weekend or this week. Um, we only need, and there might be only eight species or genus and species of trees. We only need to teach the kids those eight trees. They don't need to know all the trees in the forest. They're going to look at the trees that they're first going to study as citizen scientists or as emerging scientists. So we don't get overwhelmed by having to teach them um, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of trees. And one of the things that we made was these things here. Um, which actually has a, uh, a leaf of a tree. This is a sassafras. And then there's a, 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 um, a seed from the sassafras. And then they're put in these uh, sleeves and cotton um, behind them. And so you can, cut. And, and, and if I go back, you'll see this is the number of trees that we have at um, this area where we do a, um, at Central High School, where we have a, a program every year. So the kids use this to identify. You can make the same thing. You don't have to have the fancy holders. You can simply um, just uh, tape a leaf on a piece of paper and put it in a three ring binder, or you could laminate it, or you could, uh, you know, even use uh, um, scanning and photography or um, scanning and uh, printing. So this is pretty cool. It's easy to do. And the kids love making these. Once you identify a tree, we'll have them go out and collect the leaves. Now, granted, if we're in the uh, the fall or the winter and you don't have the leaves around, you're going to have to wait and, and do it again uh, in the spring. And then here's a cool one that I like. This is just a tree ID guide um, that we use a lot. And, and this is one that we give the kids as a prize. Um, for finding the largest tree and the, the tallest tree and the largest tree. Um, these, these they, they're expensive. This costs about $11 each, but we'll use this, but the kids can flip through it and find every, a leaf of most of the common trees that we use uh, in our area and a little description of it. So this is pretty cool, but you can actually make your own. So I'm just trying to show you some ideas that you can possibly do on your own. And then a tree identification key, a dichotomous key, where you go from uh, A to B to C to D, or from one to two to three to four, and you work your way through the identification key and come up with a type of uh, uh, whatever tree ultimately you have. And then we also use these tree identification worksheets where you uh, look at the leaf shape and the size and um, you know the type, whether it be needle or broad and flat. And then uh, if the leaf is compound or simple, and that helps us to uh, help to teach the kids how to pull um, your ID together. So it, it can be daunting, but it's, it's, it can be a lot of fun. So there we go. We, we're measuring the height. We're measuring the diameter. We're measuring the, uh, we're identifying the tree. And we're doing a few things uh, to get the kids immersed in this. And then we have this usable data. And when we use my, uh, my tree, and we're going to show you how to use my tree next week. So you come up with this table that looks like this or an infographic, or as I call it, it's a tree nutrition uh, label. And it provides that information that's timely, accurate, scientifically valid, peer reviewed, and uh, just uh, exciting that you can actually look at a tree and come up with these numbers and values immediately um, within minutes. And then what we do in is take in that middle one and we make other ones that might look like the one on the left that has a barcode. Some of them we create that have a QR code. This on the right is a tree tag. Jenny uh, Garten from Australia, Adeline, Australia is probably not on the call today, but uh, she um, sort of spearheaded and um, was the first to really use some tree tags internationally to take the numbers developed by iTree and then to showcase them on trees uh, in public places. And we've done that all over around the world now, and it's kind of exciting to be able to do that. But providing usable outputs with the tree tags, and there's your QR code, you scan that, and it will take you, you can set that up to go wherever you want, whether it to be a, a tree ID or to send you over to the iTree page or the MyTree page or wherever you wanna send folks. And then this one here is um, out in the Midwest in the United States, but you'll see the um, some folks actually have signs professionally made and printed, and these have grommets and can um, be held and, and, and go out there for a long period of time. Some are quite temporary, but this tree is going to pay us back $13,000 
over its lifetime. So um, my tree will help us to uh, come up with some of these numbers. This tree here is at the Morton Arboretum out in Chicago. It'll give us $235 in benefits this year. And again, they're using the QR code to uh, get people to go and look at another uh, um, uh, a website. And then uh, Tree City USA from the National Arbor Day Foundation works to uh, bring these out to a lot of different folks. This is um, in the part of the Vibrant Cities Lab. If you go, um, we'll put the, we have resources already online for you to go look at where you can grab some templates of these tags. But the idea is, and here's some of Jenny's uh, right here um, in Adeline, and you'll see they have a rating for the tree, and then they have the uh, values that have been all populated just by using uh, the um, I tree or my tree, excuse me. And then this is another one that we have. This is um, uh, that is put together. It's a, 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 a front and a back side of a uh, quarter fold um, informational uh, guide to taking a tree walk um, and visiting a park. And then if you look down on the picture, um, where are the kids' handprints right down here? They're putting their handprints with the, the our leaf prints by using pen and ink um, to come up with some of the ideas for it. And then this is what um, um, Liza had showed us a little bit, and this comes from um, Australia also, but you'll see a more formal one in the middle, but then here's what the kids did. They were actually able to draw their own tree tags and to customize them and personalize them. And really, um, you know, sort of like Liza talked about emailing a, a, a tree. Well, here you can um, certainly call a tree your own. And this is my tree tag. And this is what I've done to uh, take art and bring it into the um, in, in, into science. And here's another one from um, uh, Cedarburg Green. This is um, in the UK, I believe. And they had a Chinese elm, $150, $58. And then the appraisal of the tree was valued at $2,700. All of these numbers came out of using my tree. So that's all we're trying to show you here. This is one that I made that we use with our nonprofit group in, uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and in this case here, we just print these out. I have the, this, the kids go out and do this with our, our partner, the Green and the Gateway Cities Program, the City of Springfield and the Forest Service. And we'll go place these or hang these signs all over, um, primarily on school grounds and in front of libraries and other public buildings. And it really, the response is pretty amazing. And then we've had our kids do things like this. They've tried to turn things from numbers and weights and things. So this one removes 50 pounds of pollutants in the next 25 years. That's equal to 50 bags of flour, something people can relate to. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. You can do that. This tree will remove... 2,600 pounds of CO2 from the air. That's the weight of an adult rhino. So the kids came up with that. How interesting is that? You know, I never knew how much an adult rhino weighed, but they're able to equate and really tell a little story here and use their enthusiasm. Here's an international student that we had um, uh, come to visit us and we took, worked with the kids. And then these are some of the tags that uh, she worked with them to make. And then we went out and placed these at intersections where cars were stopped um, so they could have time to actually read them at the red light. And you can see um, we're putting those out in a green right here and there's a traffic signal ahead. So don't be afraid to put these out. You can have them temporary or more permanent. And then this one here, if you've heard of Dr. Seuss, um, the cat in the hat, green eggs and ham um, in the US, he's a famous children's um, artist and illustrator, uh, illustrator and author. And so this is at the Dr. Seuss National Historic Site Sculpture Garden in Springfield, where I live and our nonprofit works. And this is Marcus Catlett, who worked with our kids to go out and we put values on all the trees in the sculpture garden. And we actually hung up these signs for an Earth Day event. So it's kind of cool. And here's something we're working on now. And this is with Home Depot and Lowe's. We're in the process right now. Um, when you buy a tree, like the one I just showed you here, it gives you some information. Well, we're taking those tags and we're gonna customize them. This is the front and the back side of the new trees that were uh, tags that we're hoping to add to the Home Depot um, and Lowe's at the local level. We're trying to do this in New England here in the Northeast US. So uh, it has our MyTree, it has a web address. We'll probably have a QR code on the final versions. 
and we hope to get this into the stores um, next spring. And then Woodsy the Owl, he's uh, one of our Forest Service conservation uh, uh, icons, him and Smokey the Bear, or she and Smokey the Bear. Um, Woodsy uh, is next year going to focus on bringing iTree out to uh, uh, users and mostly youth because that's who this appeal is for. And so what I want to do right now, um, is I'm going to stop my share for a second and turn on the audio. Is that all right? Okay. Hang on. Boy, oh boy, this doesn't mic me right now, everybody. I did hear something, Dr. Dave. I think you already heard yeah, it. was probably it. just coming through the computer. So let me um, go ahead now and share it again. Yeah, I got to play the sound. This way it'll hear better for everybody. I'm sorry. So we're trying to record this. And let's see what we get. Can you see it now? I can. And I can hear it. MyTree is a free mobile web app that allows people to assess the value of individual trees. The tool can bring an exciting opportunity for students to discover the natural world around them, conduct field research, link to other STEM learning, and contribute to a worldwide citizen science initiative. The application has been developed to aid students in assessing the value and benefits provided by their local trees and producing data analysis reports in a simple, easy to read format. Using a smartphone, tablet, or laptop computer, students visit trees within a defined area, i.e. schoolyard, park, etc., and collect information on the type, size, and condition of each tree using simple pull-down menus and MyTree records the information for review, reporting, and the production of an easy-to-read graphic report. MyTree is quick, easy, and provides a great STEM learning opportunity for students of all levels. Um, Liza, are you seeing the full screen again? I do. I can see okay, it. Okay, good. So I wanted you to see that little quick video because education, like we said, is so important. And one of the ways we can get into teachers' hands is through um, things like that, just to get them excited for a second. I know that um, you're going to have to do this in your own way, but we have some materials that we've prepared and put together for using my tree in the classroom, which sort of links uh, the science to uh STEM learning, and we have a series of these that we'll make available for you, but we have uh, PDFs of these, we have some uh, TikTok videos, we have a variety of other things that can help uh, as you try to spread the word amongst teachers and educators and youth groups or uh, conservation groups or other folks, your partners that you're working with. Um, so we have some resources that can help you. And the idea is, you know, how can we bring these educational opportunities to youth at all levels, all ages, and from all backgrounds? And uh, we just um, want to make sure that we're able to reach them. And again, here's the DBH tapes, which are really popular with the kids. It's just something that um, we're really happy with. And here's your clinometer. And you can see the, um, the, the boy on the left is actually using it. And there's one of our college interns that's uh, helping him to learn it and recording the information for him as he's a scientist. And that's the intern that's helping them. And then one of our uh, um, students had just uh, built hers and she was getting ready to go out and test it outside. This goes along right here, just more things like Eliza showed us earlier, but we made a tree. This was uh, a tree here made with uh, students' handprints and, and they wrote a little bit about I love trees or whatever they wanna say. So these are the kind of cool things that Eliza was talking about bringing art into the, um, into the fold. And this is another one where we go out and have the kids go out on a, um, a tree ID and my tree adventure in a park. They go out and they um, look at the trees on a little scavenger hunt. Then they come back and paint the rocks. And then they actually put the value of each tree on the rock and then go place that rock back out there. And they play a little game of exchanging the rocks and, and some other cool things. We've done this several times with really uh, good results and they get to take the rock home they painted trees on them 
um, or they planted, uh, you know, uh, the uh, clouds or water or some kind of environmental component that my tree is helping them to calculate. So this is um, a really exciting one that we've done uh, last year that worked out really good. And then the other thing is just working with youth, but bringing their parents and their caretakers or their, um, uh, you know, whoever may be the, uh, um, the, the mentor in their life, whether it be a grandparent, uncle, aunt, or neighbor, and, and really working with them to engage and, and really um, experiment and to really become these scientists. And I put this slide in here because these scientists here are the best teachers of other kids in the class. Generally, you find a few kids that have take a leadership role and they're very excited to share. There's someone that's sometimes a little brighter than other kids or an older classmate uh, or, uh, uh, you know, in, these are our summer campers. So some kids are from fifth, but other kids are in sixth grade. So some of the sixth graders will take ownership and, and mentor a younger uh, uh, student. So this is so cool as it spreads um, in excitement. And I just have a couple here and I know our, we don't have a, a ton of international audience here, but this is one in Ireland where they have a, 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 um, a tree tags are placed out using my tree. And then we can follow a little path or a little uh, scavenger hunt or go out and uh, explore and look at the tree values. This um, and, and then associated with it, um, there's a QR code and it will pull up the Google um, Maps uh, description. And in here you'll see uh, every year uh, I reduce air pollution by 717 grams. You'll see every year I do this. It's the tree talking to you or giving you a little story. I have a trunk diameter of 118 centimeters. So the idea is the information is gathered and collected using my tree. And again, here, this is the tag that's found on each of the trees um, on that tree walk. This is one out at the um, Vanderbilt University. They've used my tree on their campus tree tour. And when you go on the tree tour, they have it electronically, but all of the values pop up here and it'll tell you what each tree is valued at and what it's doing in ecosystem services. This is another one in, um, in Australia that has the uh, same thing, another park trail. And when you get to each tree, it has a little description of the tree, and then it looks at the value provided by that tree. All of the information, that one is in the UK, all of this information is, is um, provided by my tree. And you're able to put some fancier stuff together like this as you get more sophisticated in what you're doing. So this is pretty cool because it's looking at air quality, water quality, um, uh, reducing runoff and, and other components in the ecosystem services. And this is one that my students put together a, um, a tour of some of the historic neighborhoods where we do a lot of work in Springfield. We have an urban forest field station here from the U.S. Forest Service and work with our partners at Regreen Springfield. We have a heritage tree tour in the neighborhoods. Um, uh, Springfield was established in the 1600s, so it's an older U.S. city. But on every tour, <clears throat> we look at the trees and then we give you information. It's a good way to learn the type of tree, but then we look at the value as produced by my tree. And then here's one in Texas. So this is being used all around the country and literally all around the world. And I'm just gonna end up here in, in a second with uh, just showing you, uh, we have the URL to go get some of these tree tags. You're gonna be producing some tree tags when we start using my tree. But if you wanna get started, we have a, a URL here, but it's also in the Google Drive. I just put that in yesterday, so you can go ahead and download the uh, fillable PDFs. And Isa, I'm going to show one more slide right here. And this is setting the tone for next week and setting the tone for the homework assignment I'll give you in a few minutes. Remember, the homework assignment is nothing extensive, but this is going to be the tool we're going to use next week. And um, it's only, a, I think, four minutes, but let's take a quick look at it, okay? One of the simplest and easiest ways to learn about iTree and its features is to use a new app called MyTree. And what MyTree is for smartphones and tablets, and it's a simple app that allows you to calculate individual tree benefits. And it provides you a simple estimation of the um, greenhouse gas mitigation, air quality improvements, stormwater interception, etc. All you need to do is to make a simple estimation of the um, location, species, tree size, condition, and it will 
automatically calculate in the background the values and report out to you in a simple and easy to understand way. It's intended as a simple and accessible starting point for your understanding of the value of individual trees or a small population of trees in the community. So let's get started. I'm here on an iPhone and what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my browser and in this case I open up Chrome and if you zoom in, I've gone to itreetools.org, and you can see what I can do here would be just simply go to the itree tools tab, and we'll click right here on my tree. And what it will open up on your uh, tablet, your smartphone, um, and in this case uh, an iPhone, is open up the dialog box and allows you to start to enter information. So the first thing you can do is either enter a street address where you're at, or hit the location um, uh, icon and it will confirm your address and in this case here I'm at 1-77 um, uh, Lincoln Street and I can either look in English or metric units on however I want to do my calculations in this case we'll use English I'm gonna go next and what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna provide a, a, a name and I don't have to do this but in this case here I'm gonna call it test tree 1 and then what I'll do is the next thing is I can go by scientific or common names of my species, but let's select the species. In this case, it's going to be a maple. And so we're going to pull down here until we hit a red maple. Um, you can scroll through in alphabetical order. Uh, many, many, many trees, as you can see here. So I've gone down and I'm just going to say a red maple. And its condition we're going to say is good. And the tree's diameter here in DBH, and you can also put in circumference. But let's just say that this tree is a 24-inch um, diameter tree. And let's say the sun is full sun. And so I go OK. And keep in mind, each one of these dialog boxes, you can um, hit the um, question mark, and it provides you a little information on what your, uh, uh, your data entry is asking for. Then we click Next. And is there a building nearby? And I'm going to say Yes. And what we have is a very old uh, household nearby that was built before 1950, so I'm going to say 1950. The tree itself is about 20 to 40 feet away, and the, it's it's actually, the, the um, I just went back there, but the direction, in this case, it's going to be northeast um, away from the building, and um, we can look at that, and so then what we'll do is we just simply hit finish, and at this time, we can add another tree, or we can calculate our tree that we've just looked at. So in our effort to uh, time, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to hit Calculate, and it's going to provide us an opportunity here to look at the output. So you'll see here my tree benefits. Um, the test tree, number one, red maple. It's a 24-inch diameter in good condition. And here you'll see the dollar values and the amount of uh, carbon dioxide sequestered stormwater interception, 2,900 gallons air pollution removed each year, energy usage each year, etc. And so this allows you to use the MyTree application to understand how iTree, all of the applications in iTree basically look at the structure, function, and value of what a tree is. So in this case here, we have a tree. It's doing something, and it's worth something in dollars and cents. And the beauty of the MyTree uh, application is you can carry it around in your smartphone, your tablet, and it's easy to use, it's easy to understand. So don't be afraid to try this out in the trees in your own property, in your own neighborhood, at your own school. And what you can do is here, I could go back and I can add another tree, and you go through the same process. So the idea is that it's a valuable, useful tool, simple and easy to understand. And in the end, you um, get a great report um, by just going through and doing our calculations. So that's about it for uh, my tree, but I uh, hope you that you try it. It's easy to use and uh, very understandable. Okay, so I, I want to show you that video because it sort of introduces as we get started. Oops. And so, Liza, we're going to switch it over to you. I just want to um, make one thing clear is um, I know we, we're we talking about no technology, but in order to use my tree, um, you have to have some computer somewhere. So it can be back at the uh, in, in the classroom or in an office or wherever. So 
it, it, it's the computer side of things. You don't have to use it on a smartphone or a tablet. We can use it right on any kind of a computer or a laptop. And then the other thing I saw in the chat there, I know we're going to go into discussion in a minute, but the purple air sensors, um, I'm working on a project here that's sponsored by the Attorney General of Massachusetts, an environmental justice project where we're looking at tree uh, canopy, uh, tree neighborhoods that have tree canopies and uh, neighborhoods that have no tree canopy. And we've placed uh, 55 air quality sensors in various neighborhoods across the city. And now we have them live uh, reporting online. And so we're using that as an educational tool, but primarily to empower people to better understand the connection between why we have poor air, asthma rates, respiratory issues in the neighborhood. So I can uh, show you a little bit of that on the Google Drive, but I'm gonna turn it over to Liza right now. I'm gonna end our sharing. And Liza, you could pick up from that end of it. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Dave. Um, so it's the discussion portion. If you have any questions, um, please be welcome. It's a small group. If you want to uh, turn on your videos, we'd love to see you. I have a question. I'm not going to turn my video on though because I have the flu and I'm in bed. Um, I So I was one that asked the question about the purple air monitor. Um, so I'm actually doing a project in the spring with the teen naturalist and we're getting a purple air monitor. Um, and I've done stuff with trees before with the forestry department. Um, and it would be really cool to look at the canopy, you know, the canopy data alongside. Um, because like I can't take kids to some of the lower income areas because it's unsafe. Um, so there's no way to pull that data on like uh, if other people have uploaded data, there's no way to access that on iTree. Um is there a way um, you know like if you go into iNaturalist you know you can look at, at you know observations everywhere I didn't know if there was a like a map feature or a way to see if people had collected iTree data in certain areas yes um that's what we're going to show you next week the mapping feature of this and um that's one of the ways you can search in Washington DC and see all the people okay. put data in using my tree um, but we don't put there, the only air quality data would be what I just showed you there, pulling up, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the pollutants that are intercepted, whether it be ozone or sulfur dioxide and things like that. It doesn't, and, it, and particulate matter and things like that, but it's not live. It's going to be at that uh, point that you went out and did that yeah. experiment. And, and you know, it can change by the hour or the minute. Oh, yeah, totally. But this gives us a, 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 the estimation of an average. Um, but um, well, it yeah. would be nice at least to show them that that's like an option and how you kind of can use two different data sources and kind of combine them. Because I'm doing yeah. a NASA Places project. I'm a case yeah, writer. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm doing that for my project. And I'm like, oh, this actually might be a neat thing to incorporate in as well. So yeah, no. And you know, NASA has the globe. Mm -hmm. Is it the globe what they have the tree yep. you can place that? So you know, we use that one too. And um, you know, we we my tree we just presented to uh, a NASA team um, about two months ago. So you know, oh. there's so much out there. It's so exciting to be an educator and to be you know, and 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 it, it, I'm not a I'm not a um, you know an educate. I teach I teach at a university. That's my real work that I do with the Forest Service. So this is a sideline for me. The folks that can do this and immerse yourself all the time in it, it's got to be so cool and exciting. And by default, I've just uh, seem to be, have done a lot, but um, the folks that do this uh, as your career, I'm very excited and sort of envious. Thank you for that um, question. And I have, I see a question in there from Lauren about uh, if you don't know the tree, especially if they're, um, can you have the option of generic tree? So in, I, in species, I'm sorry, in iTree database, there are over 10,000 trees already inputted in there, Lauren. I would suggest um, having uh, some sort of app if you if you can get it, like you can even do Google pictures to identify a particular tree or leaf snap. Um, I'm sure there are others that people use for tree identification if you don't know what it is. And, um, and it should be already, especially for the US, Canada and Mexico, a, a lot of trees have already been inputted into database. So I hope that answered your question. 
And I see we got some uh, from the Philippines, of course. Yep, yeah, that's perfect. You can use this as a tool to tell your story, you know, and, and that's very important. And then, um, you know, I've been around for so long that when we first had iTree, that's what we would do. We'd recommend you could put in a, a broadly small leaf and it would uh, use a generic tree. So you can always do that if you don't know. Um, if you know, say you have a, we have an international audience, but if I had a linden tree and I know that's a small, um, a small rounded shape, I can put that in and I could compare that to another tree if I didn't know, but it was a similar shape and, and size leaf. Um, but we have so many trees now in the iTree database, it's, 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 it's a pretty uh, um, robust way to look at things. Um, what was Absolutely. the other? Yeah, that, it just, uh, and, and that's the other thing. The feedback you give us is how we improve, change, and update iTree. So if you want to, and this chat is something we're going to go, I'll go through, and then we'll bring it over to the development team, and it'll go on our list of, of things. And when we see that there's three people wishing for the same thing, then we can rise the priority uh, up. And, you know, we, we're stretching dollars. That's one of the things. Um, hopefully, with some um, a new focus, we might be getting some additional funding over the next several years. Um, and that'll give us an opportunity to really take care of some of the wish lists that, um, you know, I know I, I've seen the wish list and it's hanging on a wall in uh, Kent, Ohio, and there it is. And if we had the money and we could do it, we'd take care of everybody's wish, but we have to prioritize and, and, and that's your feedback is so important to help us to prioritize. Absolutely. And um, just to extend Lauren's question, the iTree database, it's over 10,000 species of trees in there, and it's a global database. So we have so many species, for example, from our recent build out in, of ECO in iTree ECO, which is the flagship um, tool in the iTree toolbox from Delhi, India, for example. And you'll find trees in there from various other countries, Colombia, Mexico, Australia, et cetera. And it's, it's growing. So, and it's um, everything from native to non-native to ornamentals, et cetera. Kristen, you mentioned the tree equity score. Um, that is a program that um, American Forest has put out um, with for support by the Forest Service and a variety of other partners. Um, it's, and we have iTree Landscape, which gives you the similar, um, we feel a little more robust um, data exploration tools. Um, but my students, I had a group of students and I can try to get this to you at some point, but they, um, they developed a routine and a model for assessing um, the uh, a, a tree equity score using iTree uh, landscape. And it comes up with an actual number from one to a hundred, similar to what the tree equity score. So we can share that with you. We got a, um, next week, we'll have another pile of stuff in the uh, Google drive for you to get lost with. And um as we're approaching, we have four minutes left. Um, Dr. Dave, do you want to go over the assignments? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen if I can for one sec. Yeah. Do I, I think I have a PDF file here. Um, right here. So I put an assignment, it's in the Google Drive. And it's just to help you prepare to use my tree in a real world scenario. So what you're going to do, you can read the instructions here, but you're going to have to go to a site and you'll see the sample I just did here. This is at um, a National Historic Site here where I live. And I, I marked out 10 trees. And what I did is this is just a Google map that I drew on. You can take a Google map that you draw on with a crayon. It doesn't matter. But just you're going to define an area you're looking at. And then you're going to go out and identify 10 trees, the species of the tree, the DBH or the size of the tree, and then the distance to nearby buildings. And it can be any building you're close to that the tree will shade and provide um, shading for to impact how much electricity could be saved. And I put a template here that you could actually use. So that is available um, for you online uh, in the Google Drive. So. The instructions are here. Just note the number of trees. You use the tally sheet, identifies the species, record the diameter, and then we'll we'll use those next week. If you want to grab a couple photographs, you're welcome to, and you can help 
And then um, you're going to either send those in, put them in the Google Drive, or share them next week as we begin the class. Remember, we only have two hours next week. It's going to be jam-packed and full. So, But if you can do pre-work, that'll help us. As I stop sharing, and it's back to you. Great. And uh, on my end, yes, it seems like there's a lot of homework, but it's really not. Um, some are some we'd love you, for you to just share in the document. Let's start this network building and building the toolbox out. And I'll send these as, again to all of you via email, just in case um, you didn't get it today. But the other thing that is optional is if you're comfortable using my tree, go ahead and do it try it out and then also we'd love it if you could share with us uh, a map of your neighborhood trees just share it in the drive let's see um, maybe you can encourage kids that you know to create it for you um, but that's an optional one as well um, that's, again that's just wanted to uh, share this how you can communicate with me and Dr. Dave Go ahead, Dr. Dave. No, I was just going to say, and um, we're around too, so you can reach out to us um, before next week. But also, Liza is going to send out that email tomorrow that'll have a lot of the um, details if, in case you didn't get our emails or things like that. But this is uh, fun. We're excited. Um, and hopefully, maybe spread the word to some of your uh, colleagues and friends. Um, that there's plenty of space next week at um, 8 o'clock on Thursday, because we, we, we had we had about 50 or 60 people, or 50, I think, this morning. But um, we're a little scarce this, this evening, but that's fine. For We're happy to uh, help one of you. And that's uh, why we're in business. So with that, have a good night to those uh, who are about to go to bed. And for those starting off the day, I hope this has energized you. And have a wonderful day ahead. And um, we'll see you guys next week. But do keep in touch. Okay. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Might as well talk to you. I'll try to give you a buzz on my way back or down. To, I, I'm going to be busy all day. But on my way back, I'll try to give you a buzz tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. All right. Peace. Bye-bye.